Okay, um, we will continue about the diagnosis and treatment of uh, uterine fibroids. Uh, again, they are usually asymptomatic. So whenever a patient comes to us with uh, some sort of a complaint, we should take full history, of course, uh, weigh in the chief complaint the, uh, and analyze it, risk factors. We should uh, assess for or uh, ask about mass symptoms. Heaviness, uh, frequency, again, as uh, Attar said, uh, that um, large fibroids can um, cause um, uh, uh, frequency or uh, bladder or uh, bowel uh, symptoms. So frequency, constipation, sometimes pelvic pain. Um, moving to the examination, again, we start with basic stuff, general exam, vitals, general look. Um, before abdominal or bimanual examination, we sh the bladder should be emptied. The bladder should be, uh, should be uh, emptied before the examination. Uh, in the abdominal exam, we look for any lower abdominal masses. Uh, in the bimanual pelvic examination, we might find uh, adenexal or uterine uh, masses. Uh, uh, just as an example, uh, in bimanual pelvic examination, what can what can we find? For example, in subserosal or uh, intramural um, fibroids, we might the finding might be a firm, irregularly enlarged uterus with uh, protrusions that may, um, might be felt. Um, another uh, clue: if the mass moves moves with the uh, cervix, it is suggestive of a fibroid. We move to investigations. Um, we s uh, again, it's a soft uh, tissue uh, tumor or soft tissue lesion. So ultrasound is our first um, first choice: transvaginal ultrasound. Um, on the ultrasound, usually the uterus is uh, echogenic, and the uh, endometrium is uh, hyperechoic. Um, MRI is is preserved usually for either surgical planning, or if the fibroid is not uh, visible on the ultrasound, the hysterosalpingogram and saline infusion uh, so sonography, uh, usually for the uh, submucosal. Um, submucosal fibroids to see uh, the cavity and if there's any filling defects or whatever. Um, now we have some um, examples. This is uh, an MRI T2 sequence sagittal view. We can see here this is a well-defined intramural fibroid. Um, it does not indent the endometrium. If we look to the right of the um, fibroid, we can see a strip of white, whitish color. It's a uh, hyper intense on uh, T2. So the endometrium is not indented by the uh, the fibroid. So it's an intramural fibroid. Again, uh, this is uh, ultrasound longitudinal. Again, we can see the arrows, the yellow arrows, pointing at the fundus of the uterus. This is a small fibroid, small uh, intramural fibroid in the fundus of the uterus. Again, uh, MRI, T2 sequence, sagittal view. We can see here, this is a well-defined intrauterine uh, lesion. It's a submucosal fibroid, of course. And uh, the lesion indents the endometrial cavity. You can see the uh, strip of uh, whitish color again, uh, hyper intense. Uh, it, it is indenting it, so it's kind of it, the endometrium it goes around it. Uh, on the ultrasound, this is a, a, an ultrasound of the of a submucosal fibroid. And uh, uh, this this submucosal fibroid in particular is uh, located in the posterior wall of the uterus. It's displacing the endometrium uh, anteriorly. 
again we said for the submucosal we might do histoserpingogram uh, and uh, this is a picture of a uh, histoserpingogram with a filling defect this filling defect is a submucosal fibroid again this is a subserosal uh, this is a picture of subserosal fibroid MRI T2 sequence sagittal view we can look here this is a subserosal fibroid in the posterior wall of the uterus lastly uh, this is an ultrasound of a subserosal uh, uh, subserosal fibroid now for the treatment um, in general when it is asymptomatic the treatment is not necessary that's a general rule um, we treat only if the fibroids are causing annoying symptoms or are uh, or are the cause of infertility in women um, seeking pregnancies um, for us an example of certain presentations for example if uh, a patient um, comes to us with a symptom which what is the symptom it's abnormal uterine bleeding whether it is during the menstrual, pre uh, menstrual periods or uh, in between so in this case we start with medical treatment we start with uh, progesterone uh, progestin only therapies um, uh, we, we start with uh, progesterone uh, oral contraceptives um, we can also insert uh, an intrauterine system the levo norgestrel intrauterine system because it, re it releases progesterone um, other uh, uh, medications are also for the symptom itself um, I get the tran uh, exemic acid and the mefanimic acid um, they reduce the bleeding Victoria have any just continue I'll comment about it when you're done um, uh, we might also use uh, the combined uh, hormonal contraceptive methods, uh, combined oral contraceptive pills, uh, vaginal rings or patches are also used. The gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs, uh, they are only used of... Uh, but as a comment, yeah, uh, the comment, vaginal rings are not used for uh, abnormal uterine bleeding. Okay? Although they're combined, they do not work well because their systemic absorption is very unstable and it's very low. Damn. So usually it's oral combined hormonal contraceptives. Um, the gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs um, for only short uh, courses, uh, usually before surgeries. Uh, the the goal here is to reduce the volume of the uh, fibroids and the myometry and stop the menstrual bleeding but because they have the gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, we are talking about because they have side effects um, they might cause uh, vasomotor symptoms of menopause and uh, they also might cause osteoporosis so we do not use them for a long time for a, a long period of time only before usually before surgeries to ch to, sh to try and shrink the myometrium and the fibroids do you have any comments doctor before moving on no go ahead um, now we will move to the more surgical approach um, Again, the surgery depends on the size, the number, the location, and the patient's desire of uterine preservation for future fertility. Um, w we should mention that only in symptomatic or rapidly enla enlarging fibroids do we uh, yani move to the surgical approach immediately. And uh, surgery is not done during pregnancy because of the... Uh, of the complication of surgeries and we, and we are fe we fear for the um, fetus so that uh, does not disturb the fetus it's not really for the fetus it's just that in pregnancy fibroids obtain huge blood supply because of the effect of estrogen 
And if we do operate on fibroids during pregnancy, there is high risk of hemorrhage during surgery. So we avoid, whether during pregnancy or even during cesarean sections, we avoid manipulating fibroids overall because we don't like our ladies to bleed excessively and kill them just to remove the fibroids. So fibroids are usually not operated upon during pregnancy at all, not during pregnancy or postpartum, uh, peer period, sorry. Oh, tell me, Doctor. Um, we have uh, many options depending again on the size, number, location. Um, hysteroscopic resection. Hysteroscopic resection is usually preserved for submucosal fibroids less than uh, five centimeter. Um, uh, one note before uh, completing: any fast-growing fibroid in premenopausal woman or enlarged fibroid in a postmenopausal woman should be removed at open operation uh, because there's a possibility of a sarcoma. I read this in uh, the book. I don't know. Um, the next option is uh, uterine artery uh, embolization. Um, um, uh, the patient is under conscious sedation using um, small coils or microspheres we uh, that are introduced to the uterine artery we enter from the femoral artery um, in a catheter we go to the uterine artery and uh, we uh, introduce uh, small coils or microspheres uh, the goal here is to the fibroids shrink in volume and we preserve the uh, uterus we don't need to remove the uterus now um, although pregnancy is theoretically possible after uh, uterine artery embolization it is not considered uh, fertility preserving treatment because we have complications some of these complications we might that that might lead us to remove to, to that might lead us to hysterectomy and to remove the uh, the uterus uh, at all and if they get pregnant which is not recommended there's much higher risk of other complications, pl placental complications, uh, and postpartum hemorrhage, premature delivery, and so on. So it's not uh, uh, a fertility preserving treatment. The only fertility preserving t treatment is a, my a my a myomectomy. Um, we usually preserve myomectomy for uh, young female patients with uh, uh, that 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 have the intention of uh, future pregnancies and if during them the myomectomy we reached or manipulated the uh, endometrium cavity um, uh, n uh, future pregnancies the delivery should be uh, cesarean um, our last option is uh, a hysterectomy uh, would you repeat your last part I if during just yeah, if during the, uh, I read that, I don't know if that's true or not. If during the myomectomy, uh, if we manipulate, uh, if we reached the endometrial cavity, uh, okay. we should, we, the, the future, uh, future pregnancies should be delivered uh, uh, th uh, through cesarean section. And this is very correct, because if you reach the endometrium during your myomectomy, this is a hysterotomy, or in otherwise, that's an incision in the upper uterine segment and that's considered just to be like classical cesarean section an absolute contraindication for vaginal birth okay mm -hmm. that's why um again lastly we have the hysterectomy uh um we when we we, we remove the um we remove the entire uh, uterus Hysterectomy provides a definitive uh, therapy for uterine fibroids. So, but again, a lot of women uh, they w they tend to want to preserve the uterus for future uh, pregnancies. Uh, with the hysterectomy, we usually remove the tubes. Um, we because most of the epithelial ovarian tumors arise from t uh, from the tubes. Um, regarding the ovaries, whether do we remove the ovaries or uh, keep them, usually we keep them in younger patients because we need the uh, hormones uh, to, to prevent menopausal symptoms. But if the patient is uh, uh, menopausal, we, we, we can uh, 
remove the uh, ovaries. Do you have any uh, comments, Doctor? So in general, w whenever you do a simple hysterectomy, a simple hysterectomy, so the type of hysterectomy we perform for uh, benign pathologies, such and fibroid is a benign pathology. You we usually prefer to remove the both tubes, yes, because in theory all epithelial ovarian tumors arise from the tubes. So we're reducing the risk of, of epithelial ovarian tube, uh, neoplasms occurring in the future. And because we remove the uterus, she does not need her tubes. But in regards to the ovaries, they're usually preserved unless the lady has already hit menopause or she's older than 50. Okay, because the risks of osteoporosis, mood disturbance, the whole, overall all perimenopausal symptoms are increased if you remove the ovary. And we'd like our ladies to avoid these as long as possible. And the, these risks are higher than neoplasms of the ovary at that point. Uh, here we will go to, uh, you know, to just show you some examples of the surgical uh, treatment, surgical approach. This is a picture from a YouTube video of a hysteroscopic resection. This large, um, I don't know, pedunculated, I think, um, uh, submucosal fibroid is uh, uh, visible with the hysteroscope and the doctor uh, this is before uh, removal uh, of the uh, submucosal fibroid. Uh, this is the myomectomy on the left. We see the. the this, this is a laparoscopic myomectomy. That's not just an open myomectomy. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's done through laparoscope. Um, on the left, the doctor is uh, initiating uh, the treatment. He's um, uh, doing the incision and uh, on the right uh, this is uh, f any advanced after about 10 or 15 minutes uh, he is uh, manipulating the fibroid and trying to remove it um, we will just uh, also mention the uterine artery uh, embolization just a quick review of the uh, kind of anatomy. The ovarian artery seen here in uh, bright uh, blue uh, comes from the uh, aorta, from the abdominal aorta. So it's uh, and the uterine artery uh, comes from the uh, internal iliac. Uh, I have a video to show you. Um, all right. Here, uh, this is uh, the uterine artery embolization. Before uh, embolization, we will see that this is uh, the cursor is uh, uh, is above the uh, common iliac. This is the external iliac. This is the internal iliac artery, and from the internal iliac, we will find uh, the uh, uterine artery. Uh, now, on both sides. These are two large hypertrophied uterine arteries. This is pre-embolization. Tamam. And um, this is uh, after the uh, uterine artery embolization. We can see that they disappeared. So. This is the external iliac, the internal iliac, but no perfusion to the uterine arteries. Ooh. Our references for this lecture were uh, Hackers and More, essential for of, uh, obstetric and gynecology. Blueprints, obstetric uh, and gynecology, uh, lip and cuts. Ooh, and the uh, pictures were from uh, several cases, several different cases in radiopedia.org. Dr. Okay. Thanks a lot for your summarized presentation. Can you let me do a share? Because I have settings, but I don't want to take a look at it before I take the question. Thank you, Dr.
Sorry, I didn't know I was muted. OK. So in general, what you guys should know about fibroids is that fibroids are relatively common. Different references quote between 30 to 70 percent of all women during their lifetime will have a type of fibroid. Now, as any other person who doesn't know medicine and you tell them they have a tumor, they'll be concerned about malignancy. So you have to choose your words carefully when you talk about a lesion. Now, in general, fibroids have very, very low malignant potential. And it's, some people say that it's zero. But in general, the most, most number quoted are around two in 1,000. OK. Why do fibroids ari arise from multiple sites? Well, because these sites share the same embryological origin. And whenever you have a common embryological origin, there is a possibility of metaplasia. And when metaplasia occurs, fibroids might arise. That's why you might have broad ligament fibroids. In general, and uh, mesosalpinx fibroids, and fallopian tube fibroids, and ovarian fibroids. Well, we know that these tissues do not contain, contain uh, mycites in the first place. So in general, the only classification of fibroids you as uh, medical students should know are that they are classified according to site, and according to sites, they're either submucosal, intramural, or subserosal. Submucosal and subserosal both can be bedunculated. That's when they have a stalk. So depending how much of the fibroids actually engorging on these serous surfaces or the endometrial surfaces of the uterus, they can become pedunculated. In general, the most important type are submucosal. Why are submucosal more important? Because certain presentations in regards to fibroids are more significantly associated with submucosal and the, even sometimes some doctors will tell you that the different types of uh, fibroids, the other types of fibroids do not have such presentations. And these presentations are abnormally trend bleeding and recurrent implantation failure. OK, why are submucosal fibroids associated with heavy menstrual bleeding? Simply put, because when you have a fi submucosal fibroid, you'll increase the surface area of the endometrium and you'll also cause, de cause derangement in the cyto cytokines and prostaglandins in the endometrium. So first, you have more surface area, so more blood than other cycles, and then the control of bleeding is deranged due to the derangement of the cytokines and prostaglandins. And that's why we can use prostaglandins in these cases. And why do they cause implantation failure in the first place? First, because they take more, much blood from the endometrium. So when trophoblasts invade, they can't invade properly and the pregnancy will be lost. Also, when the pregnancy grows on, the fibroid will grow on and it will further impact the endometrial cavity. And when it impacts the endometrial cavity, it will have a mass effect in the, in the, in the developing embryo and it might be lost. That's the main mechanism of fibroids involvement in uh, fetal loss and subfertility. But in general, occlusion to the tubes is very rare. Okay, because they have to be somewhere around the interstitium or the cornea of the uterus, and they have to be large enough to totally occlude the uterus, and this is highly unlikely. Because even if they occlude one of the tubes, the other tubes should be still remaining really functional. In general, one of the unique presentations of fibroids are their presentations in pregnancy. As we said before, they can cause a miscarriage, they can increase the risk of caesarean section, whether due to obstruction of the birth canal, placenta previa, or abnormal light or malposition. They can also present uniquely in pregnancy with pain, either due to red degeneration, or if you have a pedunculated fibroid and it enlarges, it can tort or twist or along its pedicle. So if you have a large fibroid and it's pedunculated, it might twist and cut its blood supply and it will also present with pain. They also present with severe postpartum hemorrhage and preterm delivery due to the mass effect 
of the fibroid itself. The main diagnostic modality is always ultrasound. Ultrasound is the most sensitive and the most specific for fibroids and soft tissue lesions of the pelvis overall. But we might resort to MRI if the, if the patient, for example, is obese or we have some reason to prevent us from doing a proper ultrasound or she has uh, bulk symptoms because we fear that there's significant impact on other pelvic organs or prior to uterine artery implantation, for example, we might resort to MRI. Remember that MRI is the second best modality to evaluate all soft tissue lesions, regardless of their site. The next thing I wanted to show you guys is the different ultrasound presentations of fibroids. So here, as your colleague said, the uterus is usually echo echogenic, sorry, and that's the myometrium. The endometrium is usually hyperechoic. If you see here, the endometrium is curved upward. That's due to the impact of this intramural fibroid. Here, there is also a smaller intramural fibroid, if you can see it. Of course, does anyone know what this organ is that I'm hashing? That's the bladder. So again, that's the submucosal fibroid. That's the endometrium. The colored spectacles here. This is a double ultrasound showing you the vas culture that it's being fed significantly more than the other surrounding tissue. And here you see a heterogeneous echogenic mass representing a fibroid. This is a uterus. The, the black instead of white here because the endometrial cavity is filled with blood. This is done in the menstrual phase of the cycle. And you see here there is a large fibroid again impacting the uh, endometrium. And again, that will tell us this is a submucosal fibroid. Here are some examples of uh, subserosal fibroids. This is the uterus proper, this is the endometrium. And you'll see here, there is a subserosal mass. Again, here, of course, these are all sagittal views of the uterus. That's how the uterus should appear. But here you see, there is a mass. And that's subserosal fibroid, a posterior one though, unlike the one before. So in general, as per any other treatment of fibroids, as per any treatment, we treat the patient, we don't treat the pathology in most cases, unless it's malignancy. So treating the patient, that means we treat according to our presentation, because one of the very common presentations of fibroids are abnormal uterine bleeding, more specifically menorrhagia. We can either use Mirena, which is a levonorgestrel intrauterine releasing device. We can use tranexamic acid, which is an antifibrinolytic agent, so it will reduce bleeding during menses. We can use mefaminic acid, which is an NSAID or a prostaglandin synthase modulator. So in this case, because we said that fibroids will distort the signaling within the endometrium due to prostaglandins and cytokines, we give a drug to regulate this issue. Again, counterintuitively, because we said that fibroids have progesterone and and estrogen receptors, we can use combined all receptive pills. Why do they work? We'll, we're still not sure exactly why they work, but it's evidence from randomized clinical trials that they do work and they reduce the incidence overall. So women taking OCPs for other reasons will have lower incidence of fibroids. In the past, there was a, a drug in the near past, like a year ago, called opisteral acetate. This is a selective progesterone receptor modulator. It was used for fibroids specifically to downregulate the progesterone receptors and induce apoptosis within fibroids. But unfortunately, recently we found that it might cause liver failure. So most doctors stopped using it and the FDA withdrew its approval. We can use, we can induce hormonal, sorry, hormonal menopause by using GNRH. But GNRH, because of its perimenopausal symptom, as your 
colleague set and OC process are usually used just for three to six months. So after three to six months, the fibroid will recur and enlarge. So it's usually preserved to shrink the fibroid prior to surgery so that we can do it laparoscopically more easily. And we can use the other modalities that your colleague discussed before. The only two fertility preserving invasive uh, surgeries are myomectomy and hysteroscopic resection. Uterine artery embolization is not, and of course, hysterectomy is not. Now, this is a video showing you the exact how laparoscopic myomectomy is done. So you see here the doctors incising the surface of the serosa, surfaces of the uterus to expose the fibroid. The fibroid will appear white, so glisteningly white, unlike other tissue, and that it is. He's trying to dissect it from the surrounding tissue. Of course, this is increased by 700% just to save time. And eventually, he'll cut its stock and remove it from the body. How do they remove it? It's beyond your scope. During laparoscopy, sorry. Okay, this video is refusing to play. Here we go. So this is a hysteroscopic approach. So during hysteroscopy, in a moment you'll see a fibroid. So this is the right osseum of the uterus, and that's the fundus. And then you'll see the left ossea. Of course, these are air bubbles because during hysteroscopy we try to infuse normal saline to distend the uterus so that we can visualize the cavity properly. So that's a normal uterus. That's how uterus should actually look like. Here you'll see that there is a lesion in the posterior wall. This is a pedunculated subserosal fibroids. We usually use hot uh, electrified loops to vaporize the tissue, to coagulate the tissue rather than vaporize the tissue. And we resect it piece by piece until we reach a normal cavity. And that's how the cavity is after removal of that lesion. Now, as for uterine artery embolization, as your colleague said, we go because we know that the uterine artery is a branch of the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. We reach it through the femoral artery, and we try to, to occlude the vessels that are feeding the fibroids. So not the whole uterine artery, just the vessels. Why is it not? considered fertility preserving surgery because around two to three percent of ladies after this type of intervention will go into premature ovarian failure so they can't reproduce in the first place and there is theoretical risk of small for gestational age this is usually done by a radiologist and interventional and radiologist in the cath lab so not by us and in the left you'll see a fluoroscopic image these images of the fibroids so here you see this is, sorry. This is the uterine artery. This is the vessel, the branch of the uterine artery that's feeding the fibroid. So the doctor will go, this is the uh, catheter. It's not visible. He went this way and he's going to occlude this vessel. And eventually that's the image that you see. This is the outline of the fibroid and there are no longer feeding vessels to the fibroids. And this is just further to illustrate how the doctor reaches the fibroid. So in general, just know it's very common. It's highly unlikely to be malignant. It's either submucosal, intramural, or subserosal. It can present in multiple ways, although it's most commonly asymptomatic. It has gynecological and obstetric complications. Don't treat unless it's symptomatic. And treatment will depend on the eventual goal. Do we need to treat abnormal uterine bleeding and anemia? Do we need to treat fertility, the pain, and so on? So any questions before we end our presentation? Doctor, I have a question on ultrasound. Please. Can you go back to the slide? طبعا اهم شيء انه تذكروا انه هدول الريفرنسز تبعونكم للامتحان. Gynecology by 10 teachers, hacker and more, obstetrics by 10 teachers. 
اي صورة؟ اي كمان قدام ايوه هذه ال ال الفلويد الاسود اللي حوالين اليوترس في الصورة الثانية هذا عبارة عن ايوه هذا فيسيولوجيكال سايتس اوكي اوكي All fluids on the ultrasound are hypoechoic. So fresh blood, urine, ascites, they're all hypoechoic. This is the patch of Douglas here. Because the lady is lying supine, it will not collect in the patch of Douglas. It's just collecting all around due to surface tension all around the uterus. So this is all physiological ascites. It's not significant. It's not related to the pathology, and that's why I did not comment about it. It will just make the uterus appear more well-defined. Because fluids transmit ultrasonic, ultrasonic sound waves better than solid tissue and better than air. So you, we usually like to have full bladder, for instance, if you want to evaluate the uterus through an abdominal ultrasound, because it will give us what we call an echogenic window, something that will give us a better view of what's behind it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, looks like they're in. Oh, to the. Laughing. So again, just know that fibroids are common. They have different modalities of treatment. We only treat symptomatics and try to focus about the obstetric complications of fibroids. Because in your exam, usually you'll, you'll be asked about the obstetric complications, degeneration, increased risk of cesarean section due to previous malpresentation and. Uh, uh, obstructed birth canal, okay, preterm labor, postpartum hemorrhage, these are the ones you're usually asked about, and miscarriages. Have a good rest of your day and good luck with your studies. Bye. I love you.